Thank you, Mike. I have been accused of being many things. One of them being a man of routine. Now, I don't know why people would come to that conclusion about me. I mean, yes, I like to wake up every morning, eat my oatmeal, oatmeal with cinnamon and apples while I watch Sports Center. Yes, I like to then read my Bible using the same Read Scripture app. I like to write in the same prayer journal and then pray. Then I like to, yes, go for the same walk on the same path, taking me around my apartment complex to East Lamb Peter Park, then back to my apartment complex to take my shower and take on my day. Yes, I like to go to the same gas stations. I like to eat at the same restaurants and order the same items off of those menus at those restaurants. Yes, I often make the same jokes. Yes, I often say the same things as we pass specific landmarks. You can ask Julia about that. Yes, I like to share the same tidbits of information with the same people who already know the same tidbits of information and have likely heard the same tidbits of information thousands of times. Yes, all of this is true, but I have no idea why anyone would call me a man of routine. Now, as I was recounting my routine, maybe in your mind you were thinking of loved ones who are fairly routine in their way of living and doing life. Those who do the same things in the same way at the same time, day in and day out. Maybe that person that you readily admit, maybe that routine person is you. I've been thinking a lot about that word a lot, routine, in preparation for this message. This message that we will be in, in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, which Mike has already read. If you've not already opened there, please turn there now. Routine, what does it mean? Well, the word routine actually can be used in three different forms. It can be used as a noun. It can be used as a verb. It can be used as an adjective. The noun form of routine's definition is, is a sequence of actions regularly followed or a fixed program. The verb form of routine is organized according to to routine, which didn't make sense to me because I didn't think you could use the word in the definition of the word, but that's what I found. But what I want to talk about this morning is the adjective, adjective form of the word routine. Routine in the adjective form means to be performed as a part of a regular procedure rather than a, for a special reason. Retru routine, performed as a part of a regular procedure rather than for a special reason. There are many things, there are many that would say that the church, that the church, that going to church, that our Sunday morning worship gatherings, or maybe Wednesday night Bible study, or any other forms or facets of the church, there are many people that would describe church as a part of their routine, as a part of the routine of their lives, as a part of the routine of their week, certainly as a part of the routine of their Sunday. But brothers and sisters, Peckway Church, what I want us to see today, either for the first time or as a reminder, is that church is so much more than a routine. That the church is so much more than a routine gathering of people. That it's so much more than another routine on our list of many things to do throughout our week. That the church is certainly so much more than a regular procedure that comes with no special reason. Church, our participation in it, our worship is far from without special reason. The church gathers, the church moves forward because of the most special and the most wonderful reason that there is. It is the salvation of Jesus Christ. The church and all that it does stems from the reality that God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son, that whoever believes in that son shall not perish, but rather shall have eternal life. The reality that God did not send that Son into the world to condemn the world, to condemn us as we deserve. Rather, He sent that Son into the world to save the world, to save us as we did not deserve. This is the crazy, awe-inspiring reality of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is certainly something worth celebrating as we begin this morning and every moment that we live and breathe as individuals and certainly every moment that we gather as the church of Jesus Christ. 
It is something that when we think about it, when we pause for even a moment, it should cause us to shout, glory, glory, hallelujah. Thanks be to God for the great things that he has done. It should cause us as individuals and as the church to be something so much more than routine. And so often, church, our churches, maybe even at times, this church becomes routine. More times than not, more times than it should, certainly in our lives, church becomes another procedure. It becomes another thing to do. It becomes another box that we feel that we need to check. And the sad thing is, the downside to church becoming a routine is when church becomes just another procedure, when it becomes just another thing to do or another box to check, all of a sudden, that special reason for the church, the reason that there is this thing called the church, Jesus and his good news, all of a sudden, that gets lost in the routine. Brothers and sisters, it should not, it cannot be this way. Church should not be this way, because church is not a routine. The church is not even a holy routine. Rather, the church is a holy way of life. And I use the word holy, H-O-W-L-L-Y, intentionally. Routine, even a holy, H-O-W-L-Y routine, like going to church, it will not, even a holy routine, the most holy of routines, it will not solve your greatest need. It does not create a church. It does not make one a church member. It does not make a church. It is not what you ultimately need. It is not what the waiting world ultimately needs. Rather, what you and I and everyone needs is the church designed by Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. What the world needs is the way of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. What the world needs is not just to go to church. Rather, the world needs the church as it was designed to be and prescribed to be as our Savior. The world does not need another routine to add to its long list of routines that are prescribed for a better life. Rather, what the world needs is something unroutine that wholly changes lives. The church is designed to be that thing that the world needs that wholly changes lives. So what does that kind of church, what is the church of Jesus Christ designed and shepherded by Jesus, following Jesus, what does that look like in practice? Well, Acts 2, verses 42 through 47, it gives us one of the clearest pictures of that church that we have. And this is the way that the church was designed to be, and it comes to us at the literal beginning of the church, or at least the literal beginning of the church living post-resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 42 of chapter 2 comes immediately after everything changed for not only the church, but everything changed for the world. Everything changed for all those who follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. It comes in the days following Pentecost. The day the Spirit of God was sent by God to not just come upon men and women as it did pre-Jesus, as it did in the Old Testament, to not just come upon Jesus and men and women, or I should say, not just come upon men and women in a moment, but now at Pentecost and now for all the days that follow, the Holy Spirit of God comes and dwells in each and every follower of Jesus, in each and every one of their lives. Now it takes up residence in each and every one of of our lives, each and every one of Jesus' followers' lives. Now, because of what Christ did on the cross, because of his voluntary sacrifice, because of his atoning death, and because of his resurrection to life again, we sinners are made clean through faith and by grace of Jesus. All those who put their faith in Jesus have their sins washed away. And because of that cleansing, they can come into the presence of God. They can come into the presence of a holy God without dying. And a holy God can come into the sinner's presence without destroying unclean sinners. And that is what God has decided to do. That's what he first decided to do at Pentecost. To take up residence through his spirit within each and every one of his followers lives. Now the power of God, if you have professed Jesus Christ as Savior and you follow him as Lord, now the power of God rests within you. And on Pentecost, that was on full display for all to see. Picture the scene with me 
for a moment. People here are gathered around at the temple in Jerusalem. All people, people from all nations, people from all backgrounds, and of course people speaking a variety, a multitude of languages. And in this moment, here steps forward this foot-in-mouth specialist, Galilean fisherman. He steps up to the plate and he begins to speak, but he begins to speak powerfully and boldly. He speaks with one who has authority and he speaks with clarity as he exposits the scriptures, as he exposits the Old Testament. And what Peter does in this moment is he gives the first sermon of a new era. And as if a fisherman declaring scripture with power and authority was not unusual enough, take it a step further, is what was really unusual and amazing in this moment is that everyone understood this fisherman's preaching. And I mean, everyone understood it. All of a sudden, through the gift of God, through tongues, there was just one language. Everyone heard what Peter was saying in their native tongue, and they understood what Peter was saying in their native tongue. In this moment, fire ascended from heaven, and all who called upon the name of the Lord, they were saved, and they were baptized. On that day alone, because of this display, because of this work of God, 3,000 men and women were saved and added to the, ch the church's number through nothing more than their profession of faith in Jesus. What an amazing day for this church that just days ago was in hiding as their supposed Savior was laying in a grave. It was an amazing turn of events. It was an amazing display of God's power and authority. And of course, those that were changed by it. Of course, those that were saved by it. Of course, those that experienced this worship gathering, this movement of God, of course, immediately they returned to their routine. Of course, immediately they returned to normal, right? Of course, immediately they returned to ordinary life. They returned to everything and just forgot what had happened. Of course, that is not what happened. In fact, they returned to a life that was far from ordinary, a life that the world had never known before, a life that was far from routine, as far from what they always knew, as far from anything the world had ever seen before. And Acts 2, 42 through 47, is this description of how wholly changed the lives of the first followers of Jesus were by their first encounter with Jesus. This message is really laced with words that begin with R. We've already talked about routine and how the world of the early church was far from routine, but I've prepared for us four more R words that did encompass how the early church and how we can become like the church that Jesus designed us to be by following. Verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Making our churches more than a routine, it comes with a rhythm. Now this may be confusing at first, but the early church, the dream church, the far from routine church, it devotes itself to a rhythm. There's a rhythm to the church of Jesus Christ. And that is true whether you meet at 54 old, 52 Old Philadelphia Pike in Whitehorse or 212 Peach Bottom Road in Willow Street or anywhere across the world. There is a rhythm to the church of Christ. Verse number 42 outlines that rhythm, and that rhythm is made up of four primary beats. Primary beats that must pulse through each and every church that follows Jesus. The first beat is teaching. It is what we are doing right now. It is what we do Wednesday night on Zoom. It is the public proclamation. It is the public explanation. It is diving into this powerful word of God as a body and as guided by the Holy Spirit. It's mining this word, God's word, for all of its rich truth, for everything that God chooses to reveal to us. This, what we do when we gather from about 9.25 to 10.05, it is a core foundation of this truth. It is the spark that God used to ignite, to light the flames of the post-resurrection church. We talked about it already, but this week, take some time and read through Peter's address of the crowd and look at it for what it is. Let me give you a hint. It is a sermon. 
is what we do every week and it's what's been done from this pulpit for 145 years now. It is an expositional sermon. Meaning Peter takes the word of God. In this case, he takes the words of the prophets like Joel and he exposits them faithfully and he exposits them for the time. It is what we base preaching upon all these years later. It's a message rooted in God's word. It's exposited and it is explained. And then look at verse number 38 of chapter 1, or chapter 2, I should say. Peter closes, as we always do, with an invitation and a challenge. The people ask, what should we do in response to this? In response to this sermon by Peter, and Peter says simply, repent and believe. Be baptized, every one of you. Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He says, do this and you will receive the Holy Spirit too. For this is the promise for you and your children and for all who are far off from God, for all whom the Lord will call. I heard someone recently, someone in the church actually say, where did we ever come up with someone standing, giving a monologue in the church? Well, that preaching is actually one of the few things in the church that the church that man did not come up with. Preaching, a man standing before God, God and before man, standing in a pulpit, expositing God's word, is what God used to spark the church. And it's truly, it's a tale as old as time. It's something that has come down throughout the generations. Look that through the generations, through scripture, and you will see prophets. You will see leaders. You will see kings like Solomon. You will see apostles. And you will see Jesus himself preaching, proclaiming, and expositing God's word for God's people. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, it was not originally the talk on the Mount. It was not the discussion on the Mount. It was not originally the sermon on the podcast. It is the sermon preached from a mountain by Jesus himself. We must devote ourselves. We must put our lives and our churches in the rhythm of regularly teaching and sitting under the teaching of God's word. That's the first rhythm of the church. The first beat, I should say, that makes up the rhythm of the church. The second is fellowship. We are, you rarely hear the word fellowship, I would say, outside of the church. So let's define what Luke, the writer of Acts, actually means. Luke means much more than to just sit around and have a cup of coffee with one another after a service or at any other time. Fellowship here means the fellowship of the body of believers. He means the corporate gathering in worship of God's people, the corporate gathering in service of God's people. Again, it's what we do on Sundays at 9 a.m. or it's what we do anytime we gather and in any place we gather as Peckway Church, as God's people. A rhythm of the church is we fellowship, we worship, we serve together. We serve the Lord together. We proclaim the Lord together. We sing. We pray. We walk in the New Holland Parade. We host movie nights. We watch jugglers. We host sim sings. We gather and we worship and we serve the Lord together. We do everything in the name of the Lord together. Are you picking up on a key word when it comes to fellowship of the believers of Jesus Christ? It is Together. Together in the name and the ways of our Savior. The world does not do things together. But brothers and sisters, the church does. The first three rhythms of the church is they preach God's word. They fellowship together and they break bread together. Again, what does Luke mean here by they broke bread? bread together because he uses it later in verse 46 and there it appears as a generic term as breaking bread together as sharing a meal together in that sense in verse 46 he means that they shared a meal together like we will do friday night before we decorate the church for christmas they met together and they met they ate one of the meals one of the three meals that we partake of each and every day that's what luke pictures in luke in verse number 46 but here, Luke refers to the breaking of bread. He appears and he, he uh, references the meal in which we will partake of in a few moments. 
The meal that not only feeds our stomach, but it satisfies our soul. Here he refers to the broken body of Jesus Christ, the broken bread that represents the broken body of Jesus Christ. He refers to the shed blood of Jesus Christ represented, represented in the cup. Here Jesus or Luke reminds us that the church of Jesus Christ, they get together and they remember together what Christ has done for them. That Christ has broke his body so that we could be made whole. He took on sin and his body was broken for that. His blood was shed to cover over that. But Christ rose again and all those who put their faith in him, they will rise with them as well. One of the best ways we remember that sacrifice, that work of God, is through the table set before us. That's what Luke means, that they gather together and they share the Lord's table together. And the final rhythm of the church is they devoted themselves to prayer. Prayer, what we do at all of our gatherings, it is not just something we do at all of our gatherings. It is not just a routine. It is not just for show. It is not just to be heard before man, but it is to commune with our Heavenly Father, to commune with our Savior. Think about this. When we gather in prayer, when we gather in prayer corporately as a body, we come together as one, and we come together as one before our Savior. We come together as one before our Heavenly Father. And that Son, He takes our request. He takes our petitions. He takes our thanksgiving. And He lays them out before our Father's feet. He intercedes on our behalf. That's an amazing reality. The picture of the God of the universe through the Son of, of God bringing our requests and our petitions before God. That is not of routine, but that's an indescribable gift that God gives to us as his children. Prayer is something so much more than a routine, but it's a wonderful gift of God. There is a rhythm to the dream church, to the church that we are called to be, but there's also a rhyme to the dream church as well. What do I mean by that? Look with me at verse 43. It says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Rhymes. What do we do? Whether it's in rhymes come in songs or in poems, in raps or in sonnets, in a paper or through the spoken word. What do rhymes cause us to do? When we hear a beautiful rhyme in a song or a poem, what do we do? Where we take a step back and we say, wow, that was, that was really good. That was, that was really beautiful. When we hear a well-written song or a well-written poem or a book, we say, wow, that author, that poet, that composer, they are really good. I say to us this morning, how much more so should we step back and say, wow, he is really good as those that follow Jesus Christ. As those sinners saved by faith and by the one whom we have rebelled and sinned against. How should much more should we step back and say, wow, he is really good. How much more should we say our God is good. He is great and awesome in power. And what he has done for us is, is measurably more than we could ever ask or even begin to imagine. The signs and the wonders that Jesus has done and the signs and wonders that Jesus continues to do through his church and every one of his followers, it should cause us awestruck wonder. There is a beauty to the church as there is a beauty in a well-written rhyme. A beauty that, for example, can bring three, ch three churches and two denominations together and cause the doors to want to come off this place with praise because oh, while we are multiple churches and multiple dominations, we know the same Savior. We know the same Lord who has saved and called each and every one of us, called each and every one of us sons and daughters when we deserve so much less. There is an awe-inspiring rhyme. There is an awe-inspiring beauty to the church of Jesus Christ. And there is a ring to the dream church as well. 
Read with me, verses 40 through, 44 through 46. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. As I read these verses, I picture the church. I picture the capital C church. Each and every one of us, not just this church, but every church that follows Jesus Christ. Every person that makes up those churches in a circle, in a ring. And what is it that I think of the ring of the people is I think of the ring of people in a circle as I picture these verses. All the believers gathered around in the circles. All believers having the same thing in common. They are all one. And what's the thing about a ring or a circle when people are gathered in the ring or circle? In a circle, you can see everyone. You can look around and you can scan the faces of everyone gathered in that circle. And that's what I picture here in these verses, and that's what I picture the church should believe. The early church, they were all the believers together. All the believers had everything in common. They were all one. They were all united. And because of that, they knew when another was in need. They knew when another was struggling. They knew when someone needed a pick-me-up. But they went further than just knowing when someone needed a pick-me-up. They were the ones that provided the pick-me-up. Because they were all, in the most wonderful sense, in this together. When someone was in need, they were all in this circle and they could look around and they could see that someone was in need, but they made sure that they took care of the need. When someone in the circle, in the circle of believers, the gathered together group of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, when they were in need, they were all in need, but also the reverse was true as well. When someone had, they all had. When someone had something else, everyone else had that something as well. In the church, in the far from routine church, the church that is truly there together, there should never be anyone in need because we should all be looking to one another, but not just looking to one another. We should be all caring for one another. We as the church should always be looking around the ring of the church, the circle of the church, and as we scan, if we see someone in need, they should not be in need long. The thing that we learn here positively, and the thing that we learn negatively through the example of Ananias and Sapphira, the early church gave, but they gave so because they had sincere and because they had glad hearts. They gave and they gave to one another because they knew that the fellowship, that the oneness, that the sharing they enjoyed was just the fruits of the way that they had been wholly changed by Jesus. Just the first fruits of how they had been wholly changed by Jesus. Now their lives and all that made up their lives truly were not their own, but they were Christ. They were now Christ to use how Christ determined to be best. In the Hebrew language and culture that makes up and stands behind most of the culture that the, that the men use, that God used to write scripture, were under the authority of, your belief could not be separated from your behavior. Your faith, as James reminded us of over the summer, your faith, it cannot be separated from your deeds. In other words, your belief is always going to lead to how you behave. It's always going to be evident in how you behave. If you be, say you believe anything, but your behavior does not back up that your belief, then your belief must not be very strong. That's the truth of not only God's word, but it's the truth of life in general. What you believe always comes through in how you behave. And so for the early church, they could not be wholly changed by Jesus Christ and their lives not reflect that. They could not be wholly changed by Jesus Christ in all and every aspect of their life not reflect that. Brothers and sisters, the same is true for us 2,000 years later. Church, and remember, church is the people of God. 
Church is not a building. It's not an activity. It's not a worship gathering or a worship service. Church is not a routine, but it is a holy, life-changing way of living. It's a holy, life-changing way of being, of doing, and of serving. And it's a holy, life-changing way that comes with results. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily, daily those who were being saved. Brothers and sisters, when we allow ourselves to be wholly changed by God, when our behavior matches our belief, when we match our behavior as the church and as the people of God up with the belief in God who we have, when we humbly follow the one who humbly sent his son into the world to save those who are hostile against him, it will not only change our lives, but it will change the world. It will come with results. Our witness, and through the power of God, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, we will see lives changed by Christ. Can you imagine what verse 47 says? What happened in verse 47? It seems like a dream. It's that word daily that gets me. Daily. I looked up the definition of daily, and it means occurring every day. Daily, men and women were being wholly changed by Jesus Christ through the witness of the church of Jesus Christ. Is that not a dream? Is that not the dream church that would see daily people being saved? The daily, one more or hundreds more sinners are being saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Is that not our dream? Is that not why we are here? Are we not here for so much more than to complete a routine, but are we not here for not only our good, but for the good of all the world? For the good of all the others that surrounds us? For the good of the church? And for the good of those inside the church? And maybe even more challenging for the good of those outside the church. And that's my challenge for us today as we seek the Lord, as we come to this table that satisfies like no other. As we come to this table that speaks like no other. My challenge for us is to listen to what God speaks to us. To ask God the question and allow Him to answer it alone. Why am I here? Why did I get up this morning and come to church? Why did I log on to Facebook this morning and join church online? Why am I part of this church or any church? Is it because it's what I've always done? Is it because it's part of my routine? Is it because that's what makes me a good person or maybe a good citizen? Or is it because I love and I have been wholly changed by Jesus Christ? It's because you know that God has done for you what only God could do for you. That God sent His Son into the world out of His great love for you. That He sent that Son into our world in our flesh. But He sent that Son into the world knowing that that Son had to die. Is it because that you know that that, that that Son lived the life in our flesh that you could never and would never live? Is it because you know that even that was not enough to save you And not enough for God's love to save you. Are you here because you know that Son of God took that perfect life and He willingly laid it down on the cross, willingly laid it down as a once and for all sacrifice for each and every one of your sins, no matter how great or how many those sins might be? Are you here because you know that through nothing more than His grace and your faith, you have been saved and you have a new and eternal life with Jesus Christ? Is that why You are here. Are you here because you are with Christ? The Word of God promises, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation, it has come. The old has gone. And the new is here. Are you with Christ? Are you in Christ? Have you been wholly changed by Christ. 
Is that the special reason why you are here or is it just another part of another routine? Church is more. It is so much more than a routine. Just as this table that is before you, it's so much more than bread and Welch's grape juice. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ that was shed for you. It was the blood of Christ given to make you new, to heal you, to save you, and to bond you to another. To bond you to one, the only one that is truly good. So that you can follow Him for all your days. So that you can be with Him for all your days in this glorious gift that is the church. Thanks be to God for this gift and thanks be to God for this Savior and His wonderful gift to the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank You for this gift. Thank You for Your life. Thank You for Your body. Thank You for Your blood. Thank You for Your body that was broken so that we could be made whole. Thank You for Your blood that was shed so that we could be made clean. Thank you that your blood is the only blood that can make dirty sinners white as snow, Lord. Thank you that it is able to cover over a multitude of sins. And Lord, I ask that as we come forward as a church and we accept this gift, as we come forward and participate in the broken body and the shed blood of your Son, Lord, I ask that you would speak to us. I ask that you would speak to us and wash away and root away any forms of routine that have come between us and your church, us and your Son, Lord. I ask that today you would more fully and more clearly make us a people that are holy and fully following your Son, worshiping Him, serving Him, and one with Him, Lord. Oh, this table satisfies like no other, Lord. And I ask through the power and work of your Holy Spirit, through your word, and through this table, that you would speak to us very clearly, Lord. And I ask for that in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, I ask that, this, that we would allow ourselves to be spoken to through hymn number 247. And can it be that I should gain this wonderful song, this wonderful words and scripture, based upon scripture, I should say, that speaks to our hearts, Lord. Let's stand and sing as we are able and allow it to speak to our hearts. Hymn number 247, And Can It Be That I Should Gain.